Hello and welcome. Well, the traditional baby and toddler sleep training methods that we all know, like and trust, would you believe, originated in the 1950s and 60s. Now, as a parent, I'm sure that you've heard all of these phrases before, which include behaviours like not to allow the baby to be awake for more than a certain amount of time during the day, depending on the age, um, to uh, avoid overtiredness and overstimulation, also to watch out for a list of tired cues um, and at the first tired sign to put the baby down and ensure the baby is placed in the cot drowsy but awake. And then after this, of course, to, to work on a, um, a feed, play, sleep cycle. Now we're here today to share with you a new approach that may raise a few eyebrows. Now this approach is known as a revolution in baby and toddler sleep. It is internationally recognized evidence-based approach uh, overall, which interestingly is not sleep training at all. Um, now, what does all of this mean? Well, we're about to find out. And to help explain, we welcome our special guest, Dr. Pamela Douglas. Now, uh, Dr. Pamela Douglas is a senior lecturer at the University of Queensland and so associate pro professor at the Transforming Maternity Care Unit at Griffith University and also the medical director of Possums for Parents with Babies program. Thank you for joining us today. How are you? Hi Rachel, I'm really well thanks and um, it's a real pleasure to be here with you today. Likewise and, and very grateful for your time. We understand that you're, you're a very busy lady. Now Absolutely. following my um, introduction I would love for you just to summarise if you can please for everyone watching and listening if you could prov provide in brief what is this new um, approach to baby and in, in sleep, um, baby in toddler sleep program that you have? Mm. Well, I suppose um, if I was to just summarise the, the key points really um, mm -hmm. for parents in this approach, which is so different to what you hear out there at the moment around how to do the right thing um, by your baby around sleep, it would be to say that there's certainly a difference between excessive night waking and biologically normal night waking. Um, and that many of our babies, for one reason or another, end up with disrupted sleep patterns, which we can actually um, deal with without um, needing to let our baby cry, without using the suite of strategies that you summarised, Rachel, um, at the very beginning, you know, the conventional sleep training approaches, mm -hmm. or you might technically call them first wave behavioural approaches, but we can, we can help with sleep worries um, without actually needing to resort um, to the traditional sleep training approaches. Mm -hmm. So this is a holistic approach known as infant care and uh, neuroprotective developmental care, NDC, is that correct? Yeah, well, the Possums Baby and Toddler Sleep Program is one aspect of this holistic approach called neuroprotective developmental care, but that's a big mouthful. Parents just know it as the Possums Programs. Mm -hmm. So we also deal with breastfeeding, cry fuss problems, um, maternal mood, parental mood, but sleep, of course, is a huge area of um, concern for parents. Um, with babies and toddlers. And that's um, our baby and sleep toddler program just being part of the, the broader set of possums programs. Mm -hmm. And in preparation for our interview today, I was doing a lot of research and it seems the program is the result of painstaking work of integrating the research across evolutionary biology and, and anthropology psychology, neuroscience, sleep, medical, lactation sciences, and a whole um, realm of others as well. So congratulations um, on, on launching the program. Yeah, thanks, Rachel. It has been, um, you know, a couple of decades in the making, really. Um, should I tell you in a, in quick form how yeah if you it came can to be. How, how does this well just more how does it differ from the traditional baby sleep methods that we know like and trust I mean how, how does it differ overall 
Yeah, okay. Well, probably the, the big thing that parents would be interested to know is that we're not using extinction methods, graduated extinction methods. Now that's the technical name for um, trying to um, teach the baby um, associations um, by letting the baby, um, you know, grizzle perhaps, perhaps cry a little bit before we then go in and respond. So that's, you know, the, the concept in sleep training mm -hmm. is, is that um, we're trying to teach the baby positive associations with the cot. We do that by um, giving the baby a bit of time in the cot um, to get used to it before we go back in and respond. And sometimes, of course, parents are being advised to use um, fairly, you know, increasingly long periods of time of letting that little one cry, depending on the specific kind of sleep training program. Um, so, so that's um, what we're not doing. What we're doing is saying that um, we can actually deal with disrupted sleep patterns like excessive night waking um, or, um, you know, sleep problems during the day where parents feel like it's taking forever to get the little one to sleep and then the baby probably only sleeps for 10 or 20 minutes. We can deal with all of that without actually needing to tolerate grizzling or um, crying. And this is, this is really, um, I would argue, the way of the future because all the neuroscience tells us that um, our capacity to respond to the baby's communications or cues is what actually, it's one of the big things that optimizes developmental outcomes for our little ones. So it optimizes that, that lovely secure psychological attachment. Um, and, and yet the sleep training approaches, even though often they may be wrapped in a language around responsive settling, um, are trying to entrain the baby's biology in a way that typically um, really um, can increase stress for the family and cause the baby to, to just, just it, it's just harder for families than it actually needs to be. So, so what are some um, of the outcomes that families have experienced thus far from the program and I guess these new methods overall? Yeah, well, we've had, um, um, I'm just thinking how many studies we've actually had evaluating it now. I think we've got three um, that are either in press or published. Um, and, uh, and they show that families respond really positively to, to what we're offering with the Possums Baby and Toddler Sleep Program. Um, many actually talk about how it so in, in the studies that have been qualitative, taking in what parents actually say, mm -hmm. they'll say it just changes. It just changes our life with the with the child and makes everything so much more enjoyable, and of course that's our aim, just to make the nights manageable and the days as enjoyable as they can possibly be with your baby or your toddler. Mm -hmm. um, now, I how have I gone with telling you some of the key um, strategies? Maybe I need to expand on that a little bit. Yeah, and then we, I'd love we to ask you. Yeah, let's go yep. for it. Yeah. Okay, um, so I talked about how there is a difference between excessive night waking, which is not manageable, or mm -hmm. the, the baby or toddler being awake for long periods of time, you know, as a pattern in the night, um, versus normal night waking, because our little ones will wake throughout the first year of life, indeed into toddlerhood, if we look at studies around normal infant sleep. It's just that we want everyone back to sleep really quickly. And typically that might happen, say, every couple of hours. Don't look at the clock, but normal night waking is manageable. Not every little one does wake, um, you know, every couple of hours throughout the first 12 months of life. But if yours is one who does, that is biologically normal. But the excessive night waking are patterns of every hour, sometimes even more often, or the little one awake for big blocks of time in the night. So we distinguish between the two for a start. But then um, we need to look at how incredibly variable 
our baby and toddler sleep needs are actually. And this is why in the possums um, program, we don't ever give estimates around um, how much sleep your little one needs because truly that would be misleading. Mm -hmm. um, we just want to work with your little one's sleep regulators to make sleep as healthy and as no fuss, as manageable as it can be. Wonderful. Um, yep, and so, so then we need to talk about what those sleep regulators are. Mm -hmm. um, and we do that with parents, you know, when we're working through this together. Uh, you, you tell me, Rachel, what, what's too much information at the minute. Perhaps I won't go into the sleep regulators just now. Um, but, but what we want to do then is set up, set up a plan for making the days um, as, as governed by um, normal rises in sleep pressure as we can. And then that feeds through over time to healthy, manageable sleep at night. So then the next thing that's really important to communicate about if we're thinking of this in a really quite revolutionary way of, of um, working with our little person's sleep is this whole huge thing of our baby's sensory needs. And um, gosh, I'm talking now to a woman who's, who's there in Melbourne where it's so difficult for parents right now to meet their little person's sensory needs. But, but this is a concept that, you know, when I first began to, to pull together this program and deliver it, you know, work with parents in this way in the clinic. And that was back, well, gosh, we had the first Possums Clinic open in 2011. Um, it, it had become really clear throughout my, my professional life prior as a GP working with families, with young children, with babies, that um, little ones would were dialing up, if you like, were starting to get upset inside the house just because there wasn't enough going on to meet their needs for rich and changing environmental experience. Stimulation, yes. Yeah, that's it. Our interior environments, um, and particularly the home where, you know, we spend a lot of time, it's very low sensory for babies. And they'll tend to dial up just because there's not enough going on. But what parents are What does dial up mean? Ah, thank you. Um, this is, this is um, a kind of shorthand that we, we use when, you know, NDC providers um, are delivering possum sleep program. It's for the sympathetic nervous system. Um, so, you know, if I'm dialing up, if my sympathetic nervous system is dialing up, my heart rate increases, blood pressure increases, I might get a bit flushed and shaky and sweaty. And, but if your bubby's dialing up, firstly, there'll be that groaning and grunting. That grizzle and, you know, and writhing and then moving into a grizzle's dialing up a bit more. And then the scream is when that dial is on full bore. And I suppose, you know, what we know as, as, um, uh, as researchers really is that if we're able to respond to our babies and keep that dial as sensibly turned down as we can, we can't always keep the little one completely dialed down as you well know, and we can't always respond, but it's about setting up a sensible pattern over time of trying to keep that little one dialed down and that that's what's so good really for their developmental outcomes. It's one of the things that's really, really good for our babies. And that's, that's perhaps what's not happening for many families in the sleep training approaches, you see, because there's often a pattern of everybody dialing up over time, over the days and over the nights as they put in place the sleep training approaches. So we just want to keep our little one as dialed down as we can. We're responding to our bubby's cues or communications. But little ones can dial up inside the house just because they're not getting what they need from an environmental enrichment point of view. And their brain needs that because they're laying down all these neural pathways in direct response to rich and changing stimulation. And that's the other thing the neuroscience tells us, that it's this 
rich and changing sensory nourishment that really optimises developmental outcomes. So we just don't use the phrase overstimulation. We'd say that's very last century. All the neuroscience tells us that the baby's brain is developing in response to lovely, healthy, rich and changing sensory input. So often the little ones are dialing up inside the house. Parents are asked to put on the sleep lens. Oh, it's a sign of overtiredness. I've got to try to get my bubby to sleep. But the sleep pressure is not that high and it seems to go on forever trying to get the little one to sleep and the baby may even be dialing up. And that's when we enter into the sleep battles which are just so miserable for families, so exhausting. And we can do this in, in, in a really different way. Mm -hmm. So how am I going? Should yes, I tell you about the two sleep regulators? Um, okay, let's touch on that. And then I've got a few of, uh, a whole series of other stuff I wanted to ask you, but please, right. definitely tell me about okay. this yes, as well. Well, um, it, it's, it's just worth every parent of a baby or toddler knowing that yeah. Human sleep is, is under the control of two sleep regulators. The circadian clock, um, which is set by the sun, really. So we've got, you know, the circadian cues of daylight noise activity versus the cues of the big sleep of night when the environment's quiet and dark. And we've got the second sleep regulator, the sleep-wake homeostat, which is a system of neurohormones or chemicals that rise when we're awake and drop off when we're asleep. And when that peak is nice and high, the sleep pressure is high. And sleep is actually under the control of sleep pressure. Not all these associations that folks tell you that you've got to be setting up around sleep. That's a misconception. Sleep is actually under the control of the sleep regulators and particularly under the control of rising sleep pressure. So if we're having sleep battles during the day, Usually it's because the little one's sleep pressure is just not that high. And if we shift, take off that sleep lens and put on the sensory lens and just think, right, on with the day, what can I do? Ideally outside the house, you see, because it's so much easier to meet a baby's sensory needs outside the home. And then just keep going from a sensory point of view until that sleep pressure is nice and high. And then sleep is easy, actually. There you go. Um, so so is, is that clear? Have I yeah, explained that well? Very, very, very clearly and very well. So with what we were saying at the very beginning <clears throat> of the chat, that this is not sleep training at, at all. How is no. this so? Is it because you're just responding to their sensory needs? And as you said, just, just watching that, that cycle and actually knowing when they are tired and then actually putting them down to sleep at that point? Yes, yeah, sleep training has the idea that we can change the baby's biology, if you like, to improve a family's sense of well-being and training the biology. That's the basic idea of sleep training. Whereas we say, no, we need to work with our little one's biology. If we're working against the biology and, and getting the idea, for instance, that the child has to be sleeping through by you know, six months of age, or if we're trying to work against the biology, there'll be some families for whom the sleep training does you know, seem to work. But we know from the research that for most families, actually, it doesn't decrease night waking. But that, that actually can set up so much more stress and distress than families need to be experiencing. Mm -hmm. We just want to make life as enjoyable and as easy as possible when you've got a baby or a toddler in the house. So what type um, of families have sleep training work for them then? <laughs> well, I always think, you know, that, that um, certainly our high sleep need babies are going to respond well, whatever we're trying. Um, I mean, if we look at the, the sort of bell curve of baby sleep needs, let me let's talk about newborns for instance we can have newborns who hardly need nine hours total in a 24-hour period now i wouldn't really wish that on a family and they are at the very low end of that bell curve if so that would be a very low sleep need baby or newborn but but normal with normal developmental outcomes um, you know normal sleep habits down the track and then you can have a newborn who's taking 18 hours um, you know, in a 24 hour period at the other end of the bell curve, still very normal. Um, 
and then everyone else in the middle, you know, but, but it's not useful to talk about, you know, your baby needs an average of 12 hours or average of 14 hours. We just want to work with your baby's unique sleep regulators and with your own family's unique lifestyle needs, actually. Um, so you can see that these high sleep need babies, no matter what you do, really, it's, it's going to seem to work. Um, but there have been four systematic reviews. In fact, I, I noticed um, another one coming out recently that um, show that the, the, the sleep training approaches, if you drill down into these, these systematic reviews that synthesize all the, the evidence in this space, the sleep training approaches aren't really decreasing night waking. Um, now, if it works for you, that's, you know, that's absolutely fine. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. But so many families are either finding it's not working or they just make a decision that it doesn't align with, with their, their values, their own unique parenting values. And, and we can never judge anyone's parenting values um, and are looking for something different. And before I developed up this program and, and we started to deliver it in 2011 and then um, um, at the end of 2012, after we um, presented about this program at a conference, Dr. Cole Whittingham um, introduced herself to me and she manualized it for me and, and integrated it with some acceptance and commitment therapy as well. Um, and then we went on to publish the theoretical frames. But before I started to develop up the Possum Sleep program, there was really only two options for parents. You either used conventional sleep training or you kind of, it was, you know, people were told we'll just go with the flow. But often that flow was not very much of a flow at all because families were often moving into patterns of waking every hour. Or the baby was awake for long periods in the night and really, you know, restless and, and not settling back to sleep. And parents were beside themselves with, with um, sleep deprivation. Um, but the only solution then that would be offered was the sleep training. So, you know, this really is um, what we've done from 2011 um, with the Possum Sleep Program is, is truly revolutionary, actually. So, so you have mentioned that sleep training can make life much harder than it needs to be for families and may even mm. cause excessive night waking. Now, can you yes, explain yes. why you believe sleep? Sleep training often makes life a lot harder than it needs to be for families. And, and yes. listening to what you're saying, is it that it works against the baby's natural biology? Is that what it is? Yes, that's it. So, you know, when our babies are dialing up, where and where, so firstly, the little ones dial up, but we're hardwired to dial up when our baby dials up. That's from an evolutionary point of view, that's, that's what it is to be a parent. And so if our little ones dialing up because we're putting in place these strategies that we've been advised, um, then we'll dial up too. So we've got a situation that becomes really quite stressful for many families and the focus during the day tends to be locked inside the house to get the sleep routines happening. The little one's dialing up more and more because there's just not enough happening inside the house from a sensory nourishment point of view so we can get these trajectories of real distress and of course if we do manage to to get bigger blocks of sleep during the day which is what parents are advised to do, um, then in fact, you won't see this immediately, but one, two, three, four weeks down the track, we've got a really disrupted circadian clock. And that's when the, the excessive night waking and the blocks of time being awake in the night can really kick in as a direct consequence of the advice to get these big blocks of sleep during the day. Um, parents are told that they should be doing that for their baby's brain to grow in an ideal way. And it is, that's actually, if, if, if you really look at the evidence, that's, that's a misrepresentation, mm -hmm. but it, it frightens parents. And, you know, if I tell you that, Rachel, you'd walk over hot coals to try to do that for your baby. Um, and this is, you know, 
this is what I think we can change. We change. can think about our, our baby and toddler sleep in a completely different way that just enriches the days for everybody, takes the stress out of sleep. And I, you know, I have the view actually that we'll get our best sleep outcomes down the track for the whole family throughout childhood. If sleep is really just no fuss, um, relaxed, cuddly, and under the control of the sleep regulators. So that means if there's any problems ever about sleep, the first thing we do is just get that regular get up time nice and early in the morning, because that's what keeps the circadian clock really healthy. So we can be a bit relaxed about that if there's no sleep worries. But as soon as we've got sleep worries for our babies, our toddlers and kids right throughout childhood, the first thing we need to do is to get that regular get up time the earliest possible for that particular family. And that's what sets good healthy sleep from the circadian clock's point of view. Um, and it, remember, it takes a couple of weeks to affect any change. Change happens incrementally. Um, when we're resetting sleep patterns. Um, but that's the first thing. And then sleep in the evening is under the control of sleep pressure. So, you know, sometimes we get it wrong. We think his, his or her sleep pressure is rising and we give it a go. But if that little one's not going off to sleep easily with the, you know, if it's a little one and it's the breastfeeding off to sleep, or bit older and it's a story in the snuggle, then the sleep pressure is not high and we just get on with family life and try again a bit later. Um, so, so, you know, if we look internationally, babies are going to sleep more like 8.30 or 9pm at night. Um, in our society, as part of the sleep training approach, little ones are advised, we're advised that they should be down at 6pm, 7pm. And, and actually, that might work if you've got a really high sleep need baby. But imagine if you've got a, a low sleep need baby, and a lot of us have. It's tough, but a lot of us have really low sleep need babies down closer to the nine hours total in a 24 hour period. Well, that little one's going to be waking from 1 a.m., 2 a.m., and you know, every 45 minutes, every hour, every 45 minutes, every half an hour, because their metabolism is ready to start the day. Mm. So, in your research, then making what, sense, am I? Yes, absolutely. Making sense to you. Yep. So, with the, I guess, the more higher needs um, uh, families, as you were just saying, with it, I sleep need babies. Yep. Yes. Yep. Now, what have you found is the most common problem that the um, pa uh, parents are presented with con concerning their infant sleep, and how would I guess your method then sort of overcome that and, and help those families? Yep. Well, I guess. <coughs> Excuse me. So I guess the, the high sleep need babies tend not to be the problematic ones so much. It's, it's those with low sleep need babies or indeed in the middle who are trying to put in place the sleep training approaches who can run into problems. Um, so let's, let's imagine um, that um, we've been told that it's not okay for our um, four month old to be awake for four hours, five hours during the day. And so after two or three hours, we're inside the house, let's say the little one's starting to dial up. We're thinking, oh my God, I've just got to get this baby to sleep. And so we might start some rocking or bouncing on a fit ball or we might be trying to put the little one down in the cot but then the baby cries. We might find that even though we're trying to get that little one off to sleep by a lot of vigorous bouncing on the fit ball, the little one's cranky and not looking like going to sleep. And we can find that a lot of the day goes into trying to get a baby to sleep in a way that's depressing. Frankly, it's depressing for the primary carer who's trying to do this. So we'd be saying, let's, let's think about the day completely differently. Let's be really relaxed and trust that when that sleep pressure is really nice and high, as long as the little one's also not, not hungry, and if we're looking at little ones, this is where you're using the breast frequently and flexibly. If you're bottle feeding, you can use the bottle in the same way. 
Um, so frequent and flexible offers of milk, if we're looking at, at our little ones, let's say in the first six months, and then rich and changing sensory nourishment, which basically means that you as the primary carer, and, and this is much easier when we're not dealing with a pandemic, but you as a primary carer create a day outside the house that's highly social with your friends. Lots of walking, because the little ones love the richness, the complexity of the natural, or the, the streetscape, or the, the, the natural environment. Um, you know, all those parent groups, which even in Queensland have not yet really been opening up post-pandemic, or um, but, but uh, you know, um, certainly pre-COVID-19, um, I'm forever encouraging um, primary carers to get really socially engaged in parent groups. Um, you know, this is, this is the kind of lifestyle that feeds us as parents, as primary carers. It's good for us and the baby just fits in. Um, and sleep happens on the go when the sleep pressure is nice and high and sleep becomes easy. And if the little one is falling off to sleep in the car seat and you've arrived for that lunch date and you get that little person out, if they need to stay asleep, they'll stay asleep. If they wake up, it's all right. They'll you know, catch up later if they need it or they didn't need any more sleep and we're just on with the day. Mm -hmm. You'll often hear that they cry when they wake um, because they need more sleep. But but we would say that that also is a misconception. This is going uh, to be quite difficult, uh, not difficult, but just different way of thinking for so many mothers um, and mothers to be, to ad adapt this completely different sort of yeah. technique. It's, it, and as yeah. you said, it is um, revolutionary. So it does take some adapting. It's a paradigm shift in yeah. thinking, in behaving, um, and it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's quite in, an intriguing and interesting method, but no doubt it works because the science is behind it. Um, yeah. yeah. Which I, I find That's really right. interesting. And I wanted yes. to ask you, how did the concept of a baby's sensory hunger come about also? Yes. Well, um, I guess I was starting to see, um, in the research literature from the 2000s, the importance of environmental enrichment really for um, the laying down of neural templates. And environmental enrichment is both um, experience across all the senses, um, but that, that also includes um, social enrichment, you know, interaction, that wonderful to and fro between a loving um, adult or a loving big sibling really and the baby and over that first year you know that to and fro interaction those reciprocity chains are growing and becoming more complex and longer that's part of environmental enrichment but certainly being out um, outside the house um, relative to the sensory poor interior environment I could see that we had a real problem with that in our society I suppose I'd always been interested in um, anthropology, cross-cultural studies, evolutionary biology, and, um, and could see that um, in what you might call the environment of our evolutionary adaptedness, human babies were exposed to much more environmental enrichment than, than um, can easily occur in our um, nuclear family with often just the one primary carer on her own or with perhaps one or two other children or whatever inside a home. Um, so it was using that lens, it became clear to me. And I suppose all of this, Rachel, is couched in my own experiences way, way back now as, as a mother and just dealing with families over and over from, you know, the mid 1980s as a GP. I also um, started out my um, career um, working um, in Indigenous health with First Nations peoples and learned a lot there about cross-cultural differences wow. um, in, in the, the space of um, the perinatal period. Um, so all of these influences and then, of course, rising up out of the research to optimise these neural templates, our babies need lovely input across all their senses, as well as all of that lovely 
um, building up a reciprocity chain socially with loving adults. And, and I realized that, that the, the sleep training approaches were actually substantially decreasing um, the kind of sensory nourishment that our, our infants could access and, and was, was causing little ones to dial up just because there was not enough going on. So, so, um, so this was sort of how I started to think of different ways to frame it for families. Mm -hmm. And you've also mentioned that we can't teach our little ones to sleep and that sleep is under the control of the two uh, biological sleep regulators, as you mentioned before, yeah. the circadian clock and yeah. the waking homostat. So in, in saying that, um, is there anything else that you can maybe just expand um, on, on that at all? Because I, I do find that, that that is quite fascinating. Yeah. And it's, it's, um, I mean, look, it's a really you, important concept, isn't it? Go on. Yeah, no, it's just that you, you mentioned that the amount of sleep a baby or toddler needs will vary with their own genetic inheritance. So as you've yeah, mentioned, some yeah. babies have a higher and lower sleep needs. So yeah. is, how, how does a parent understand what these needs are at such an early um, stage of, of the baby's life to be able to adapt yes. like this technique to it? Yes, such an important question because we just experiment. You know, it's the same way that we work out what our baby's signalling with their cues. Who knows? We just experiment. And, and so we experiment with two tools. We talk a lot. Um, so in, in the Possum Sleep Programme and our NDC providers who, who might be working with parents, we talk a lot about the two tools um, to keep our, our babies dialed down. As this is looking particularly in, in, you know, the first year of life, the first six months. Um, there's um, milk, um, but this other second tool of rich and changing sensory experience. And we just experiment between the two with our little ones. And then as they're developing, um, you know, obviously we've got solids as part of the mix. We just want to make sure that we haven't got a hungry child, but then we're experimenting with, well, let's change the sensory environment and see what happens. So rather than having on that sleep lens where we interpret things through, okay, the little one's tired and I've got to get him or her down to sleep. We experiment with a change of sensory nourishment and keep them going while the sleep pressure's rising. Um, you know, um, well, I guess the baby and toddler sleep needs are really incredibly biologically variable. So exactly. it's just a matter of experimenting and finding what works and when and how. Is that right? That's exactly it. It's kind of thinking sensory nourishment instead of thinking, now I've got to get my baby to sleep. And then if the little one's experiencing lovely, rich sensory nourishment, let's say you're out walking child's in the stroller you look down they've dropped off to sleep they've been loving the world and then they've dropped off to sleep or um, let's say dad's gone for a little bit of a walk in the evening air with the bubby loves it loves being up close to dad looking out watching the and next thing dad looks down the little one's dropped off to sleep or for our breastfeeding women of course um, the breast is this wonderful tool to keep little ones dialed down and very often, particularly depending on the age of the baby, just dials that little one down so much that the sleep regulators kick in. There's no bad habits associated with breastfeeding or bottle feeding our children to sleep in these, you know, these, these um, months, first months um, or going on throughout that first year of life. With breastfeeding, of course, we can use the breast um, frequently and flexibly all the way through until a woman decides she's ready to wean. Um, and we can use the breast as a tool for sleep um, without any concerns about bad habits. Babies don't wake excessively in the night because they're breastfeeding. They wake because if we're moving into excessive night waking. They're waking because of disrupted sleep patterns, not because of breastfeeding.
Interesting. Well, look, overall, the Possum Sleep Program was the first to work with the knowledge about human sleep regulators and to create, I guess, the intervention that improves infant sleep patterns. So congr congratulations on all your hard work. Um, we didn't uh, get to speak about the article which you have published, but uh, we have published for you. But of course, we'll have the link through to that. And the title of the article is Baby and Toddler Sleep Help it isn't sleep training and everything that you have mentioned is included in that article also, which is wonderful. Overall, if you were to summarize your key messages for anyone watching and listening, um, what would they be? We can let our baby and toddler sleep be easy and still be supporting wonderfully healthy developmental outcomes. Um, if we have excessive night waking mm -hmm. or a sense of distress around our child's sleep, there is a program that you can look at that, um, as parents tell us over and over, really can turn your life around and make the days and the nights so much more enjoyable and manageable. Oh, wonderful. And if families and parents have um, got any questions for you, whereabouts can they find you? Uh, possumsonline.com is our website. Um, Possums for Parents with Babies is our Facebook page. Um, and we're also their um, YouTube channel, NDC Baby and Toddler TV. Lots of free material available as videos, blogs on either the website or of course in the YouTube um, TV channel. Um, yeah, we're out there and we'd just love you to come and join us. We've got online parent support. Our PIPS um, closed Facebook group is growing at a great rate um, for support for families who are wanting to deal with these things a bit differently. Um, so yeah, come and have a look. Wonderful. Thank you so much for your time today and really look forward to the opportunity of another chat in the not too distant future. But in the meantime, please just stay safe and we'll speak soon. Okay. See you later. Thanks, Rachel. Okay. Bye.